Hello, everybody, and welcome to Peaceful Anarchism on the Voluntary Virtues Network. And you could also find me on theconsciousresistance.com and theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have um, a little bit different. This is uh, not really uh, an interview, more like a debate uh, with uh, Todd Lewis. He uh, He's a Christian philosopher. He's worked with K Keith Preston, who has who's an anarchist on uh, on his uh, attack the system dot com uh, website. He's wrote a few articles there. Um, I guess um, um, you know criticizing his uh, you know you know just pointing out I guess some points of contention. Um, and he and he's uh, he's had a few podcast episodes with uh, with Keith Preston as well. Uh, so we're gonna debate. Um, so I will be debating the voluntarist anarchist position and he will be debating uh, what he calls mere Christianity or distributism and we'll uh, he'll describe a little more what that's about um, and uh, you know like uh, like any debate I like to um, you know make sure we both understand the logical fallacies and we'll have the logical fallacy website in the description to the video um, so anybody who wants to learn more about those um, basically errors in in logic and reason uh, in order to keep you know a, a debate um, understandable and uh, comprehensible by most people. <laughs> so um, so yeah, we'll be talking about some uh, you know moral and philosophical inconsistencies uh, on both sides, uh, uh, and you know um, and we're gonna see where it goes. So uh, so Todd, thanks a lot for coming on the show. Well, thanks for having me. Yeah, I uh, I think you commented under my John Sermon debate and video, yes. and uh, you know you enjoyed that. So uh, you know you you expressed interest to have a debate, and uh, I'd like to debate more people. Um, but amazingly enough, most people decline, like especially people on Facebook who mm -hmm. like to comment and criticize my posts and almost to troll type level. And mm -hmm. and, and I'm like, all right, well. If you if you uh, you, you know you you love to argue so much, let's have a debate. You know, um, you know, basically face to face, but uh, live. And uh, and yeah. I, th I think we can get more ideas across in a debate than you know typing on Facebook comments, which is uh, very tedious and you know slow. And uh, yeah, and yeah. Mo and most people decline that. It's it's really amazing how most people don't take mm -hmm. me up on that on that offer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've had problems with that too. People just don't want to hash it out, you know. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know what that's about. So, yeah, thanks a lot for uh, for accepting. It's uh, it's nice. Sure. It's nice to exchange uh, points of view and you know present mm -hmm. your, present your case to uh, to the listeners and then uh, you know let them make their own decisions. So, um, so yeah, can you I guess just um, you know, state your case and what is when you say uh, mere Christianity and uh, distributism. You know, okay. what, what you what you sure. see as those things. Okay, so uh, mere Christianity comes from the title of C.S. Lewis's book called Mere Christianity, where he discusses what he would consider the minimum acceptable beliefs that all Christians would hold. So, right, well, personally, I think he was an Anglican. He wasn't writing the book to defend Anglican Christianity or attack Roman Catholic or, you know, uh, Lutheran Christianity, but it is in a sense to define, broadly speaking, what, what would the minimum requirements be. So, right, in mere Christianity, the um, virgin birth, the resurrection of Christ would be, all Christians would accept that, right? Prohibitions against um, incest, murder, adultery, lying, stealing, all of those things would fall under the rubric of mere Christianity. Uh, generally, um, I guess you could say mere Christianity would also line up rather well with the former moral majority of the 80s and 90s, since it was a it reached across denominational lines. It included both Protestants, Catholics, to a lesser extent Orthodox, but there weren't very many of them in the country at that time. So that would be mere Christianity. I mean, I won't limit myself completely to that, but I'll try to be general in that regard. Like, what would the Christian tradition say about these issues? Looking at it as a whole, mm -hmm. whether I agree with everything in that tradition is different, but as a whole, I think it's a useful guiding principle. Now, distributism is the economic theory which states that property is best when widely distributed. And that comes from Aristotle. Aristotle says that he argues for private property because it's moral. Private property allows people to develop responsibility and more importantly, one of the virtues, the virtues which he calls uh, 
magnanimity, which is allowing you to give properly at the right time to the right people. And of course, if you don't have anything to give, then of course, that virtue cannot even be developed. Similarly, Paul echoes that in uh, his uh, epistles where he says that, let a man not steal so that he can work and then give to the poor. So we see, well, charity is not the same as magnanimity. Both Aristotle and Paul argue that you have to have property to then develop, develop a surplus so you can expend it in a way that is, uh, gives you uh, virtue. It create, it's, habituates you to virtuous lifestyle. Um, and the other argument, uh, the reason why widely distributed property is advocated is that it uh, is one of the preconditions for freedom. C.S. Lewis argues that the only man who can be truly free is a man who eats his own mutton on his own table raised on his own land. Because if the government owns the land or a large corporation owns the land and he has to be employed by them, to some extent his conscience is captive to his job. If they decide to fire him, he might not say certain things. Whereas a man who owns the land that he lives on and works the land that he lives on is free to speak his conscience without fear of usually a business reprisal, but not necessarily always that. So that would be a, a very brief introduction to those two positions. So what would you say the difference is between um, distributism when you say uh, Aristotle um, you know, says that mm -hmm. pri private property must be distributed? Uh, so the difference between distributism and socialism, are they synonymous? Yeah. No, no. You see, I would consider distributism a form of – we might disagree on the term capitalism, but I think that any – system that's based on the ownership of private property is a species of capitalism, though they're not all the same. I mean, crony capitalism isn't the same as laissez-faire capitalism, but both are based on private product, private ownership. Distributism is also based on private ownership. Aristotle argued that um, property in general would should... Um, well, actually, let's go back to the root word of economy. What does economy come from? It comes from the Greek word oikos nomos, which means household law. And the idea was that the economy was the study of the means by which a family could sustain itself by producing the necessary goods for survival. Minimally speaking, of course, surpluses were produced, and that could then be traded and bought and sold. And the idea was that the arrangement of property should be at the level of the family, because that's where uh, you, you, the society itself is grounded. So, right, there's one of three ways you could distribute property. It could be collectively owned, like in a social society or a communal society. It could be completely privately owned in the sense of individuals owning property, like in a laissez-faire libertarian voluntary society. Or the locus could be at the level of, of the family, a kind of it's, – it's, it's greater than the individual but less than the collective over the state. And uh, Aristotle, the Christian tradition and distributism and in general would argue that the, the fundamental building block of a society is the family. The family, you start there and then you build up. Because as Aristotle said, man cannot survive as a lone individual. Um, otherwise, he'd be a god or an animal. And the first – in most oldest and natural means of humans coming together to better serve their physical needs is a family. And then from there, other forms of social systems derive. And so private property would be considered, um, again, one of the best examples of distributism in practice, though sadly most distributists don't use it, is the account we see in um, the Old Testament, specifically with Joshua, where he divides the land amongst the tribes of Israel. And um, how Israel, the different tribes are given plots of land within those tribes, certain families are given plots of land according to the, to the needs of the family, where a smaller family would need less land to live than a larger family. So a larger family would, would be allocated a larger plot of land. So those would be some of the rationales for distributism. So, so the way I describe um, the economy to most people is, um, is basically, I guess, a, a very similar definition to voluntarism, which is basically um, people engage, you know, peaceful people engaging in voluntary interaction and exchange, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that can be going all the way back to basic barter, 
<clears throat> you know, mm-hmm. exchanging items for items or services for services. Um, mm-hmm. And that and that has its associated limitations, which is what, um, you know, uh, stimulated the invention of money. Um, but mm-hmm. um, but that, you know, and, and when you do that, when two people voluntarily engage in exchange, the only reason they engage is because both people um, would benefit from it, right? So it's always a win-win, mm-hmm. right? Because if it's a win-lose, mm-hmm. then one person is coerced, and that would not be a, an economic exchange. That would be um, a crime or theft or you know assault or rape mm-hmm. or something like that. So <clears throat> both people have to be willing. So both people benefit. So therefore, there's always an increase in the standard of living whenever people are free to engage in voluntary trade. So at the basic level, it's two people, and then and mm-hmm. you can you can um, you know compound that as much as you want and make that into millions of people. And it's basically the same thing, people engaging in, in free uh, and peaceful interaction, right? Now, that's completely divorced from the state. Any state uh-huh. coercion, any, you know, protectionism, uh-huh. subsidies, um, you know, any bailouts, no taxation, nothing like that. No coercion, no violence, right? Because once you introduce violence uh-huh. into the equation, you're no longer talking about um, peaceful economic exchange. Um, <clears throat> so uh-huh. so that's the way I look at it. And... and um, and you know it, it's it's interesting what you said about uh, the family, um, and because I uh, yeah I, I agree with that that uh, you know the family is is very powerful uh, you know uh, it, actually I think I think the, the the closer people strengthen their familial bonds with each other mm-hmm. and, um, and and you know with your with your close friends and with your neighbors I think the more um, the state can be rendered obsolete and well, not obsolete, irrelevant. Let's say because mm-hmm, because mm-hmm. a lot of people who who don't have that kind of familial support from their from their friends or family, um, they begin to use the state as a crutch, you know, to lean on for survival. Mm-hmm. You know, as in is in food stamps, EBT cards, welfare, right, subsidized housing, mm-hmm. you know, Medicare, Medicaid, um, <clears throat> and so the incentive becomes. Um, once once you have a welfare state, you know, a growing massive welfare state, the incentive basically is to not treat your friends and family with kindness and respect because who cares if they're not going to support you because you always have the, ba- the you know, the big daddy, uh, mm-hmm. the big daddy state coming in to, uh, or, or the nanny state coming in mm-hmm. to protect you and, and, and uh, you know, help you up and everything like that. So it can, it kind of subsidizes immorality, <clears throat> Right. And, exactly. Right. So. In fact, that's the argument that Hans Hoppe makes in Democracy: The God That Failed, um, which I think has a very interesting book. He makes a lot of very interesting points. One of the points that Hoppe makes, of course, is the actual development of private property was developed in the context of families and inheritance. Right. So someone would, the family would be the, the unit in which property was disposed of, and of course, you then had to determine who would inherit it when you died. And, and that's another thing. Um, in a society where childlessness or illegitimacy is normative, the very – see, private property itself is an idea that has certain presuppositions, certain beliefs or structures that undergird it itself. Uh, you have to first have these things before you have private property. Mm-hmm. One of those things, of course, is the family because – if there's no inheritance, there's no next generation to pass the property on to next, then private property loses a lot of its meaning because you're here today and gone tomorrow, and then you don't care what happens after. Mm. And then again, one of the, one of the arguments Hoppe makes in Democracy of the God that failed, that's why he argued that kings were more likely to care about their land, their property, than a democracy was because you're here today, gone tomorrow. It's not mine. It's not my friends or family they are going to take care of it. And again, that's also why the Marxists who directly attacked private property attacked the three pillars of private property. They attacked um, the family. They attacked organized religion. And um, I would also argue they also attacked state structures. And they argue that all three of those undergird to some level private property. And they attacked all three. Because they understood that if you if you attack the foundation of private property, it'll collapse in on itself. There will be nothing to sustain it. It's like you have a, a building and you knock out the walls and the roof falls down because there's nothing holding it up. Mm. And, and family is one of those pillars. And so private property should be arranged in such a way that it strengthens the family, which in turn strengthens one of the fundamental pillars that undergirds the private property system. And that's why I think uh, distributists uh, argue for what they do because they're saying we need to have a family-centric economy 
rather than an individualist or collectivist centric economy. Uh, <clears throat> so, so when you say um, a family centered economy, like so, so, so you said you said um, according to distributism, you know, property should be distributed, right? Mm -hmm. But. <clears throat> but how how would it be distributed? That's, that's my yeah, question. Yeah, well, actually, yeah, for, first of all, I wrote an article on this on my blog, and yeah. I'll link to it in the show notes later. Yeah. But, okay, fundamentally, there's there's a, quite a few ways in which you can do this, right? Uh, assuming, you know, sort of Robinson Crusoe scenario, you could, uh, if, if that's the general convention of property, then people would just naturally do that, right? So in a communist society, the natural assumption was that private property should be commonly owned and they just they just did that in a private property society like in the united states you don't necessarily need to enforce it because people automatically behave according to those principles right they just act that way because that's how they believe it should be it's it's the way they understand things to be it's right in a private property society people aren't going to just say oh let's let's organize it according to common ownership of the means of production well they they wouldn't they don't think that way they wouldn't organize it that way so now, I think the question you're really asking is, we don't have that now. How do we get there in the future? Well, the way there's a few ways we could do that. Um, one of the ways we could do it is, uh, no, this is this was done by the Russian state. This could be done by a, a private bank. But the example that I'm going to give you was uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, the Russian Empire uh, realized that they needed a middle class. The 1905 revolution said, showed them that the gap between rich and poor was too great, and the communist radicals could use that as leverage in their revolution. So they went about creating a middle class by creating what they call the peasants' land bank, which would um, the peasants would invest in the bank and they would use that to buy up land from the boyars, the Roman, the Russian nobles. Then they would then f give that land back to the uh, peasant communes. Of course, they were not, they, and then they would then divide it up amongst themselves. And by the end of by 1914, 80 percent of European Russia the land was in the percent of the hands of the peasants rather than the boyars. Now, again, you know, we wouldn't have to have a state to do that. We could have a, a private bank set up that would buy up property and then distribute it according to those principles. Uh, another way you could do it, uh, again, uh, Taiwan did this in a similar way. What they did was they, when they, uh, the land of the landlords in Thailand, they said basically, look, if you give us the land, we will give you shares in the new companies, the new tech companies that we're going to be uh, creating. And so what they did was they were able to relatively peacefully transfer the land from the landlords to the people that worked them. They also had a system whereby the people that worked the land, it was kind of like a rent as you a rent to own process where basically they were paying a sort of rent, but once they paid a certain amount, they would then own the land they worked on. And so they accomplished what was accomplished in mainland China. Well, sort of. Mainland China just had the state take over all the property. They accomplished what Mao claimed to want to accomplish, giving the land back to the people. And again, it was through compensation. It's like, look, you're going to get an equivalent value in shares in a company, and which, means, which will give you the controlling interest in the company. And then the people that work the land can then work a certain amount of time to pay to pay the price of the land, and then they own it. Uh, and then a, a third way would be a sort of um, people that have gained land unjustly. For instance, the, uh, the banking class that we see in the 2008 crisis through fraud was able to acquire a lot of land. You could just uh, have legal suits against people that acquired land unjustly. And that land could then be divided amongst the victims of the uh, fraud according to such principles. So these are, these are possible ways it, by which you could distribute property in this way. Okay. And again, I had to use state examples because those are the ones that I have, but you could mm -hmm. easily substitute those with private actors like banks or churches or uh, concerned social uh, groups like, you know, um, fraternities. Mm -hmm. All right. I, I wanted to go back to what you said about um, private property in the United States, and you, you mentioned crony capitalism and laissez-faire capitalism. Um, and um, I stopped using the term crony capitalism like months ago, maybe a year ago, because mm -hmm. um, I, I saw um, one guy who said that uh, <laughs> you know that uh, you know saying calling what we have today as crony capitalism. Is calling um, rape uh, crony lovemaking, 
right? <laughs> so <laughs> cap- mm-hmm. capitalism, maybe we should define capitalism, actually. This, this would probably be a good, uh, good, good sure. segue for that. Um, because, and I think, I think we, we, cause we did a video before, uh, which I, um, you know, I, I, I'm going to put up, um, but, um, um, uh, so, so the way I look at capitalism, um, and also actually I think this is the way it's defined in the dictionary is basically the private ownership of, um, of, you know, the, the thing is the, the means of production, the factories of, you yeah. know, things like that, mm-hmm. of businesses of, uh, um, you know, entirely, entirely <laughs> devoid of any state control right so no state mm-hmm. when no state whatsoever so they're basically defining anarchy but they're not <laughs> defining anarchy so basically yeah private ownership you know no no regulations no minimum wage no um no uh, osha nothing mm-hmm. like that nothing like that so um do you, do you agree with that, is, is well, it, that, that I mean, definition? well i mean i agree with the mm-hmm. dictionary definition although i'm not sure the dictionary definition necessarily is as broad as you make it sound it seems to me that any system yeah, yeah, in yeah, which, yeah, yeah. They don't, they don't mention ocean all that. I'm just putting that in, but yeah, basically, no, no, I know, yeah. no. But basically, any system where private property is the normative right. means of ownership, right, uh, would be I consider a form, a species right. of capitalism. They're not all the same, obviously. I mean, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so what I was saying was that's the reason I stopped using crony capitalism is because the what we have today is such a mutant perverted form of what true Mm -hmm. like when i what i consider capitalism is free market capitalism right that's to me that's a fuller definition a fuller descriptive word to to describe it um Mm -hmm. and i think that that illustrates it better and so today what we have today is what what i would call more corporate fascism right merger between um the corporate Mm -hmm. uh, entities and the state right and state power um you know the state granting them uh, the corporate shield, sovereign immunity, um, um, and uh, legal protection from um, you know fraud and from you know any kind of uh, wickedness that <laughs> that they do, um, that and they're they're basically mm-hmm. able to you know get given free passes that most people or most businesses are not, um, and yeah. and then they and then the you know and then they 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 turn around and they uh, oftentimes um, you know. Um, pay off and bribe various politicians and get them to pass laws, right? Favorable preferential laws in favor, mm. that kind of thing. So that's that's kind of the way that I view that. And um, and so yeah, lazy fair capitalism is to me a, a, a synonymous term with um, with um, with anarchy, free market capitalism, that, that kind of stuff. So, okay. so so what would you say? Do you have any comments with that? Well, not not to belabor the point too much, but uh, I wouldn't call what we have today fascism. I, I've heard it used a lot by the by the left and by libertarians. But it really shows an ignorance of what fascism is. When Mussolini said that fascism was the merger of corporate and state power, what do you mean by corporate power? What Mussolini means by corporate power is the idea that, um, okay, within, within, within the Italian nation, there's different industries, right? There's the fishing industry that might be composed of, say, different companies, but there is the fishing industry. So for him, a corporation is kind of like a guild. Each industry is, is organized and has a sort of representative body. So you have like the fishing industry, the lumber industry, the mining industry, and they would all be homogenized. And then they would have representation within the fascist system, and then they could um, work out their... It was a kind of collective bargaining where all the companies would be merged into one industry. And so we don't have that at all in the United States. What we have in the United States is very diversified corporations, uh, you know, and they're and they're not organized like like a guild system where you have this sort of like collective. Because right, right, the whole point fascism, the whole point of fascism, according to Mussolini, he wrote for the Encyclopedia Britannica back in like 1930 something. What is fascism? And basically, it's a species of socialism. And the argument is that he's for the uh, empowerment of workers, just like socialists say they're for the empowerment of workers. And he argues that by creating these corporate corporate uh, guilds that all the lumberjacks, all the fishermen, all the miners have a level of corp- uh, collective bargaining that they wouldn't otherwise have. But he also understands, unlike the socialists, that pe- you can't have worker management. People don't know how to, you know, you have to have special technicians to run factories. And so they would select from within their guilds managers that would run those factories i think what we have now is closer to mercantilism you know you think of like the east india company right. or you yeah. think of a lot of the uh, early companies in america like mm-hmm. the hudson bay company mm-hmm. 
you know, these were no granted our companies aren't state chartered because we have enough private capital. We don't need state chartered companies. But in a lot of ways, like mercantilism, we have this sort of like buddy buddy system where these companies can work with the government, get special treatment from the government, and the government gets extra profits. So I think I think fascism is unhelpful because it's politically charged, because it's misunderstood, and certainly what we have is not fascism. Um, it's closer to mercantilism, I would say. But even then, it's not quite the same thing either, because mercantilism believed that the goal of the economy was to have a surplus uh, in trade and not a deficit in trade, and to hoard precious metals, which again, we don't do that either. Um, we run a trade deficit, and we don't hoard precious metals. So it's, it's not mercantilism either. <laughs> But I think mercantilism, in a general sense, is probably closer to what we have. But that's more of a definitional disagreement. Um, yeah, I think, I, think um, I mean, the trajectory, um, especially, I'd say, has taken, uh, has, has been much, much quickened since, since 1913, the creation of the Federal Reserve, of, uh, mm-hmm. of um, I guess, the centralization of state power, you know, the expansion of the federal government, um, the creation of all of these, all these, you know, federal agencies, um, the, you know, vast increases in taxes, you know, especially the, the, the income tax. Um, and then, and of course the, mm-hmm. hidden, the hidden tax of inflation as well. Um, but, um, see, so yeah, so the trajectory, the way I look at it is, uh, cause, cause, you know, looking at like, um, ca- talking about Karl Marx and his 10 planks of communism, um, many of those can be applied today, right? Yeah, there, yeah, many of them are in place. Yeah, many of them are in place, right? You know, you have, you know, the public education system, you got, you know, the Federal Reserve, right? Monopoly on money, you got, you know, you know, Organized m- labor. monopolize, yeah, 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 mon- yeah, monopolies on, on transportation, you know, on, uh, what do you call it, on, on roads, you know, um, highways, things like that. So, so a lot of a lot of those things are already in place. So so it really seems like I mean communism I guess would be the the end goal <laughs> that'd be the that'd be signify collapse to me complete totalitarian I, I collapse. I think what I think what you'd say is we're in this according to Marx we're in the stage of socialism. Socialism is that state where right before you get to communism where you're in this transitional phase. Right. So yeah. maybe maybe socialism is a better word for what we have now. Um, yeah. Regardless, it's not good. <laughs> regardless, no, no, it's it, not. It's not good. Regardless. The way I look at it, um, and 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 uh, you know, talking about the, you know these this elections, because everyone's always asking, what do you think about the you know the the candidates and everything, and Trump and <laughs> and Rand and uh, and uh, Bernie Sanders, and um, and it's just, interestingly, my my um, a lot of my a couple of my friends support Bernie Sanders, <laughs> including my, most of my many of my family members. So I'm surrounded by a lot of socialists, um, mm-hmm. and so it's difficult to talk about these issues with them. <laughs> um, but um, you know, I really think that it, it would actually, in a kind of a twisted, w- weird, twisted way, benefit the United States to have like somebody like Donald Trump or, or Bernie Sanders because it would basically quicken the demise of the uh, of the federal uh, of the of the United mm-hmm. States Empire. <laughs> Because you know, in the same way mm-hmm. that, the, that the Roman Empire collapsed, you know, uh, one of the reasons was due to their vast overreach, their imperialistic overreach mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and overextension, as well as the uh, you know devaluation and debasement of their of their currency, um, mm-hmm. a, as is happening right now with all this quantitative easing, one, two, and three. Um, and you know, interest rates like n- at near zero and soon to be negative territory, completely absurd. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I think like, um, I'm, I'm sure a lot of my libertarian friends would, would love to have Rand Paul, you know, at the helm of the, uh, you know, mm-hmm. but, uh, but unfortunately, if you know, if, if things go sour, which, which most likely they would under, under the next president, um, it's like it seems like to me they're gonna blame libertarianism, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because it happened under his watch, right? And that's kind of exactly unfortunate, as if as if one man really has the power. Uh, it it, 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 it to me it's like a you know a, a train that's out of control, and and it's been going like that for decades, maybe maybe a century, and so no one person is gonna is gonna turn that around, and it's just like I think yeah, my goal is just to, you know, educate people about what's going on and what is likely to happen and basically to prepare for, for that collision. <laughs> Brace yeah. yourself, basically, and, uh, you know, um, you know, get your yeah. uh, financial affairs in order as much as you can, get out of debt and, and uh, things like that. So, yeah, <laughs> that's the way I look at it, the trajectory. Mm-hmm. 
I'd I'd like to get back to uh, the question you asked again. Uh, this is more of a further clarification. You said, "How do we get there?" Mm. Now I mentioned how we might get there, but another equally important question is, "How do we stay there?" Because mm -hmm. uh, power tends to centralize over time, and we need to have measures in place that would prevent the centralization of power. See. One of the things that it's not necessarily always the case with voluntarists, but there seems to be a tendency to correctly, of course, worry about the centralization of state power. But there seems to be uh, a lack of concern for the centralization of private property or corporate power if it's done through private property systems, right? So if, I mean, if a state were to centralize property, that yeah, it'd be upset. But let's say a private individual does. And they could raise a private army. Um, I mean, it happened in the past. In the Roman Republic, it happened. People would raise private armies because they're huge estates. That's equally dangerous, even though it's technically not a state in the sense of a you know, government. Um, and, of course, the left commits the opposite error. They concern themselves extensively with corporate power, but not at all with state power. So I feel like centralization of power anywhere is, is suspect and dangerous. And... For private property, I would say, and this is one of the most radical, I think the only person I've ever heard advocated something like this, oddly enough, was an anarchist. But what, what I would advocate to keep property distributed is in the Bible we have what we call the Sabbath year and the Jubilee year. And the Sabbath year, every seven years, all debts were forgiven and all debt slaves were freed. So right, in ancient times, you might fall on tough times and have to sell yourself into a specified period of servitude to pay off a debt. It was actually quite common in the early American Republic as well. They were called indentured servants. Um, but every seven years, they were to be freed. And then every 50 years, any property transaction that took place, the property would revert back to the original owner. Now, those two systems would create... Well, well first of all, Sabbath year would hit the reset button on the economy. Uh, debts are canceled, people don't get into debt bondage, and then with the uh, Jubilee year, property reverts back to the original owner. And the way you would I I enforce Jubilee, I think, is pretty simple. There's a principle in economics called usufruct, where it says that I own the property, the title to the property, but I give you the right to develop it. So let's say, hypothetically, uh, I, I own a piece of land and you wanted to build, say, uh, uh, near a river, and you wanted to build a water mill on it to generate power for some some industry for some use, you know, steam turbines or something. So what I what, what this system would look like is you would consult me. I'd say, okay, I think it's a good idea. We'd agree on how much profit I would receive from the use of my land, and then I would give you a certain lease for a certain amount of time. And at the expiration of that time, the land and everything on it would revert back to me. But there'd always be the possibility that, you know, after that reset, we could then renew the contract should it serve our interests. Um, and that's how I think a Jubilee system could be implemented now. Because, um, of course, the economy is much more complicated than the ancient world. And then uh, the forgiveness of debts, the Jubilee, because this is the one anarchist that I read. I think his name was, um, oh, no, I forget his name, <laughs> but um, something Graber. He wrote the 5,000 Years of Debt, a book where he describes the history of debt, mm -hmm. and he talks about um, the, the, the problem of debt. And that's another problem that I don't think that libertarians actually deal with. Um, debt bondage or debt slavery is, is I mean, the so proverb says the lender is a slave to the, uh, the debtor is a slave to the lender. And, you know, that, that's true. I mean, ideally, we should all, we all want to stay out of debt. And some people fall into debt through no fault of their own because of... You know, maybe let's say you're a farmer and you buy extra seeds so you can sell them for more profit, but then you have a blizzard that wipes out all your crops. And so now you're screwed. Um, and, you know, those kinds of situations, it's easy to exploit someone in that situation by saying, hey, you know what? We'll loan you the money to, you know, pay the interest on the debt that you already have, but, you know, you're just going to get deeper into debt. And, of course, one of the, one of the problems with the debt-based system is that it does allow for the creation of uh, a, a single unitary property holder because if everybody gets in debt to him and they just 
uh, he just, you know, they default on the loans. He just take it all pennies on the dollar. And he owns all the land and create a new state now. It's a danger that that's very easily can happen. Um, and it has happened in the past. For instance, Frederick C. Howe was a Republican progressive in the early 20th century. And he wrote a book called The Confessions of a Monopolist, where he describes how monopolies in the United States work and how people get really, really rich. And, of course, with corporate fraud that the state facilitates, what they do is they pump up bubbles and they say, hey, yeah, buy, 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 when it's really going to pop. And then they, you, then you, you're left with all this bad debt. They want to get rid of the bad debt. So they fraudulently say, hey, you, uh, you should buy this. And then when you buy it, they unload the debt on you and then you're, you have to, you're left holding the bag. Um, <laughs> and uh, other things is – and you don't even need a state to do this. Frederick C. Howe mentions that the railroads – what they would do is uh, give only one newspaper the right to sell newspapers on, on their, at their stations. So it was a de facto monopoly on the railroads. And so one guy could just, because he was a friend of the railroad tycoon or whatever, could start selling newspapers. And he was the only one that would do it because the guy that owned the railroad wasn't like anybody else do it. Um, and one of the ways the railroads would actually get the land from the people to build the railroad is what they would do is they create these bubbles and they say invest in it it's really really good and of course when the bubble inevitably popped they would have to sell their land for pennies on the dollar um and classically throughout most of world history a kind of debt reset was inevitable uh it was it was it was actually recognized as a necessity by the cultures that practiced it I mean, right now, there's no way we're going to be able to pay, what, the $900 trillion of debt we have since 2007? You know, the global debt after the crisis with the toxic assets? Mm -hmm. There's no way that can possibly be paid off. It's more than, it's like over 100 times, well, it's almost 100 times more than the, uh, than the U.S. Uh, GDP every year. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so talking about the monetary system... Um you know, you know, empires and, um, you know, huge states of the past um, have often, many times, um, the reason for their collapse and their failure has been due to, um, um, yeah, like corruption of the money supply, right? Because mm -hmm. the money supply is the lifeblood of the economy, right? That's how it runs, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and, and again, and, and this is... Um, you know, you know, like the, you know, you can go back to how money is created, and you know, money, true money is basically created by you know, again, by voluntary, you know, people choosing to use a particular item for its, um, uh, for its qualities that it has, right? You know, it has to be durable, fungible, mm. um, portable, yeah. interchangeable, all this kind of stuff, um, and and then you know, a, a, a very good store of value, right? Which which oftentimes, mm -hmm. oftentimes money does have until they are co-opted and controlled by um, pharaohs and kings and emperors and dictators mm -hmm. <laughs> that uh, eventually discover ways to um, devalue, cl the money cl click, yeah, clip the money um, or just print it in vast amounts and distribute it to their friends. So, and then once that happens, you know, you know, just things go awry and prices rise and people blame the, you know, people blame the business owner and class warfare and all this kind of stuff is generated. Um, so, mm -hmm. so yeah, so, so, you know, you know, um, and then, and then you're talking about, you know, the debt now. And of course, you know, <laughs> you know, any kind of central bank, the Federal Reserve, you know, every, every single country has, you know, there's, there's really is no country that has a, uh, a free money right now. <laughs> it's kind of unfortunate uh, that we mm -hmm. come to this situation. But, um, but yeah, one of the things that, uh, that I love about voluntarism and, and anarchy is that, uh, you know, anarchy basically um, means no rulers, right? I, I, I mm -hmm. don't want a ruler for myself. And I equally don't want a ruler for you or for anybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, and voluntarism is basically just you know advocating for voluntary trade between peaceful individuals. Now, any any kind of economic system that's voluntarily um, chosen, like you know, mm -hmm. sure you can you can definitely um, develop a, a community of people that that um, you know have this distributism um type of system which is fine no problem you know as long as it's as long as it's voluntary that's the mm -hmm. only thing that's the only idea that i'm uh 
that I'm against is coercion. You know, um, mm-hmm. using using the state, which which is why I am an anarchist, right? Using using the mm-hmm. state because if something, if if an idea <clears throat> is beneficial and useful to the people, why do they need to be forced? to fund it right through taxation right because if, if they mm-hmm. really wanted it like you know you know we talk about democracy like you know we are the you know we are the government and we vote <coughs> we have the power you know powers with the people okay so if the people really want something to be done i don't think they need to be forced to be to do it <laughs> or forced to fund it mm-hmm. right if enough people go out there and say i <coughs> want this <laughs> i think that it can happen because people tend to think that government is this kind of superhuman entity mm-hmm. that can do mm-hmm. things that the, that the individual cannot, right? Whereas, mm-hmm. whereas what 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 I think what needs to be understood is that is that the government, you know, is itself composed of human being, mere mortals, right? Individuals mm-hmm. that claim um, the legal right to do things that that individuals be, would consider a crime, right? Counterfeiting money, right? It's called currency creation or, or the mandrake mechanism or quantitative easing, right? Um, you know, mm-hmm. th- theft is called taxation, right? Or income tax. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. You know, uh, spying is called surveillance. You know, kidnapping is called mm-hmm. arrest. You know, all, all these kind of political mm-hmm. euphemisms to me that conveniently cloak um, the fundamental what they're doing. crimes and evils perpetrated by state officials, right? Or, or even mm-hmm. even murder, mass murder is called the war on terror or just war itself, right? Mm-hmm. You know, this mm-hmm. is one of my favorite Voltaire quotes is, um, you know, it's forbidden to murder unless you do it to the sound of trumpets. <laughs> well, what's, yeah, it's interesting is that quote actually comes from the church father, uh, Cyprian from the third century. Really? That's where the the first use of that comes from. And of course, Voltaire was a well-read guy, right? He's a very well-read uh, guy. So, because when I heard Voltaire, when I read Voltaire, I said, wait a minute, that sounds very familiar. Where did I hear that before? <laughs> oh, yeah? So I looked that up and cool. yeah, it's, um, now this, this is getting, I think, to some of the moral aspects of uh, this position. So I, I think the argument is this, that if something is really good for people, you don't need to force them to do it. They would, they would, freely choose to do it right is that is that kind of the gist of the argument yeah basically okay. um would you would you agree that there's a possibility where people don't really know what's good for them um i mean that doesn't necessarily mean you can force them to do something but that you know they just they just don't know what's good for them and yeah, they should do it but they're not doing it um i think there's a few examples that I can give where forcing someone to do something that they don't want to do that is in their best interest is justifiable. The first example would be children. Children often don't know what is best for them, and one would hope parents do, and then they would compel their children through various incentives to do that. Another reason, another example would be an addict, an alcoholic, a drug addict. I, you know, I, I mean, especially if it's a if it's a parent or someone uh, a, 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 a citizen in the society, maybe someone who runs the chamber of commerce or maybe someone who runs a church. These kinds of inf- you know these kinds of influential people can't really be allowed to do this. It's, it's going to harm the rest of their obligations. And so people engage in interventions and say, "Look, stop it! You're just going to go cold turkey, and we're going to force you to go cold turkey." Most people, even voluntarists, probably would not object to something like that even though the person would not consent to it. Another example would be, and this is the one that Walter Block used in his discussion with, um, oh, let me see, who was the guy that did this podcast? It was Adam Kokish. It was about spanking. And he said, uh, Walter Block said, well, if someone's going to uh, uh, throw himself off a bridge mm-hmm. because they are depressed with their life, you know, as a libertarian, as a person, I'm going to knock them down and say, hey, wait, reevaluate your life. Don't throw it away and jump off the bridge. Mm-hmm. But then he says, you know, would, would that be legally uh, or sanctionable? Mm-hmm. And you actually kind of see that in the movie The Incredibles when Mr. Incredible saves people and they get hurt in the process and then they sue them. Right, right, right. So the train is going <laughs> to the train is going to fall off the tracks and they're all going to die. Right. So Mr. Incredible stops the train but of course the momentum is such that it knocks them back and they all break their, their necks are all damaged and they have to they start <laughs> suing them. That's a very libertarian thing to do, right? You're going to sue the guy that saved your life. But um I feel like in all those situations people would agree that well yeah, I mean they didn't consent to it, but they didn't know it was good for them and um, a lot of people would say, well, yeah, those are justifiable 
uh, unless you know there's more information available that would render them unjustifiable. Uh, like mm-hmm. let's say the child gonna run out of the street. There's a busy street with traffic. You don't need to consult the child before you pull them out of the street. So what what I'm saying is, having set the precedent that some non-voluntary uh, actions can be legitimate to do for the best interest of other people. Oh, and, and then one more example: uh, mentally or physically handicapped individuals would not, especially mentally handicapped, would not be able to consent to the caregivers that are hopefully looking out for their best interest. I would argue that if we apply that analogy to the state, do states misabuse it? Sure they do. But so do parents, so do caregivers, so do pastors, so do, so do people that run um, you know, the chambers of commerce and people that run um, fraternities. Uh, but I also we have, we have to deal with the Pareto's 2080 rule. Pareto came up with the iron law of oligarchy. Now, the 2080 principle, you might have heard in context of economics, where 20% of your customers produce 80% of your revenue. Mm-hmm. But the other way is 20% of the population is going to rule over the other 80%. And, and that would be, I think, the way the American founding fathers, even libertarian thinkers like John Locke would argue, is it's the natural aristocracy. People that are the most fitted for these positions are going to rise to those positions. And in virtue of their talent, they're going to have these higher p- positions of administration. So I would argue that according to the Iron Law of Oligarchy, for which there's almost no exceptions, uh, the 20-80 rule, 20% of the population can rule the other 80%. And the principle that, okay, if we have a cor- an obviously corrupt family, the father's an alcoholic, uh, the mother is uh, uh, abusive, maybe a drug addict as well, the children are repeatedly beaten and not taken care of, Obviously, concerned citizens are going to want to take those children away and make sure they have a better upbringing. But one is not going to conclude from that that we should abolish the family. Yeah. No. No. Well, what I'm saying is the argument – this doesn't cover all arguments against the state. But the argument against the state that, well, they don't always look out for our best interest is no reason to advocate its abolition no more than any other position of authority.